time when he went to China, Steve was a pro-choice atheist. He came back no longer with no choice. Through speaking about this issue, he met Father Paul Marx, even as the founder of the organisation he runs, and ended up working for him in running the Population Research Institute, which Father Marx had already had also started. I've known Steve for almost 30 years. I consider him a very good friend. He's a very eloquent speaker and has a great message for you. And uh, put your hands together for him. It is wonderful to be with you all here today in this great company. And I mean great company, not just because of your thousands here, but you are joined in spirit by millions across Australia, by hundreds of millions in North America, where I'm from, the United States, by hundreds of millions more in Latin America, and by, let's say, a billion or so in Asia. You are also a great company because of what you do. You are the voice for the voiceless, you are speaking for those who have no voice. And you are doing it out of sheer love. There's no interest here represented. Nobody is trying to sell anything. Nobody is trying to get you to buy anything. You're here because you're warm-hearted, loving, kind-hearted people who realize the sanctity of all human life. And you are a great company for that reason, each and every one of you. And I'm proud and honored to be part of your great company today. I was not always with you. 43 years ago, in fact, I realized this morning, to this day, on, in March of 1980, I was in the operating room in communist China where Red Army doctors were doing forced abortions on women who were seven, eight, and nine months pregnant. They were also forcibly sterilizing these women. They were also killing babies at birth. So I was an eyewitness, unwilling eyewitness, I must say, to forced abortion, forced sterilization, and of course, infanticide. In my naivete, because I'd never really thought about the pro-life issue, I thought, well, that's happening in a one-party dictatorship. That's happening in communist China. It, these kinds of abuses wouldn't be happening in my own country. But it wasn't long after I returned to the United States that I realized, a little late, of course, that seven years before, almost 50 years ago now, seven black-robed tyrants on the Supreme Court declared abortion legal in my country up to the very moment of childbirth. And there it was. All of the evils that I had seen in China were happening in my own country. The young teenage girl who's frightened, who's told by her school counselor she has no choice but to get an abortion is being denied a choice, is being forced into something she'll regret perhaps her entire life. The husband or boyfriend who tells his girlfriend that he doesn't want another child and she should go in to get an abortion is being denied a choice. We pay under some presidential administrations for abortions, lots of them using our tax dollars. We pay for sterilizations and for contraception as well. All of the things I had seen in China, including the killing of handicapped children, was happening in my own country. And so I decided, like you, like each and every one of you, that I had to do something about it. And so I began to speak out on behalf of the unborn in China and in my own country and around the world. I joined a great movement, which was already in existence in the United States at that time. The greatest movement, I think, in human history. Again, billions of people are with us around the world. We are not alone, although it might seem like that from reading the newspaper and social media posts. We are the majority, the pro-life majority in the world. After Roe versus Wade, 
We had marches every year like this one in our capital and in all 50 states. We wept for the unborn. We erected tombs for the unborn children who were sacrificed. We sought to remember them in every way we could. We sought to pass legislation at the state level, often overturned by our Supreme Court. We sought to open crisis pregnancy centers to help women who needed, deserved a choice instead of just being forced to have abortions. We did everything we could. We even put in 1980 into the a political party platform, the Republican Party, a plank protecting life. And we tried to elect politicians uh, who told us that they would be pro-life. Some of them kept their promises, some of them didn't. They were politicians after all. In 2016, we elected not a politician, but a businessman who actually kept his promises, put three pro-life Catholic justices on the Supreme Court. And in June of 2020, Roe versus Wade went into the dustbin of history. That did not mark the end of our struggle but perhaps it marked the beginning of the end. What it did was it sent the issue back to the states, to the state legislatures, to cities and counties throughout the United States, where the battles continue. In almost half the American states now, abortion is severely restricted. In some states, from conception. In other states, we've passed heartbeat legislation, where the law now says that when the unborn child's heartbeat can be detected, at six weeks, more or less, it is then not legal to take the lives of unborn children. And heartbeat legislation is the legislation that keeps on giving because the technology keeps improving and we keep being able to detect the heartbeat earlier and earlier and we know the heartbeat begins at 21 or 22 days after conception. And so we're moving back to date and saving babies in the process. The struggle continues in our local crisis pregnancy centers. But we now have in the state of Florida, for example, not just, not just heartbeat legislation under consideration, but we have a bill that will give $25 million to crisis pregnancy centers to help them compete with the very well-funded death machine that is known in the United States as Planned Parenthood. And we continue to march and we continue to pray. And we will continue to march and pray and work for as long as one single child is sacrificed in abortions. Even one death is too many. Now I'm going to look to the Archbishop for confirmation here, and I'm, I'm so pleased that you're with us today, leading us in this fight look for, to you for confirmation when I say that uh, that one soul, that one baby is worth the entire material universe. Because the material universe will one day pass away. But that baby, that soul will be with us forever. So carry on bravely. Fight on. Never give in. Never give up. Thank you.